Mikey Nailway, Mola Piani, thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from South Africa. You are a postdoc research fellow at the Center for the Exploration of the Deep Human Journey at Wits University in South Africa, and have been recently been made a National Geographic Explorer, largely thanks to your continuing work at the famed Rising Star Cave, site of the discovery of the hominid Homo naledi. We also saw you recently on CNN as the focus of Inside Africa's Changemakers edition. So uh, how have you been doing, Ken Hillway? Things must be pretty intense after the CNN piece aired. So um, have you been enjoying it? Hi, um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm doing OK. <laughs> and like you said, things have been pretty um, intense, uh, mm. possibly before the whole CNN thing happened. Um, the ball started rolling as soon as I joined the center for the exploration of the deep human journey. And it's just been building up since then, you know, with CNN and with National mm -hmm. Geographic. It's never ending, but I love it. That's his umbrella. And his coat. More cigars. Well, before we get into your fascinating work at the Rising Star site, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Now, your main passion currently is paleoanthropology and the study of human lineage. But originally, you wanted to be an archaeologist, and all because of a cartoon that you watched at age seven. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> much how, how it went. Uh, it was a Saturday morning. I was watching cartoons with my mom before she left for work. And we were watching an episode of The Adventures of Tintin. And that mm -hmm. episode was Cigars of the Pharaoh. And for some reason, I just got hooked onto that cartoon series. And just watching Tintin, who's a journalist, go on all these adventures, discover lost civilizations and artifacts, and tell that story about them really um, captivated me. So I wanted to be that person, right? Um, so, I, you know, I kept saying this to my mom, like, I want to be like Tintin. I want to be like Tintin. And she was like, so instead of saying, oh, you want to be a journalist? She was like, oh, so you want to be an archaeologist? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to remember that word. That's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> um, and I spent a good half of my life um, just obsessing about archaeology, reading a whole lot of books. Um, like many of us, we got interested um, with, you know, uh, Laura Croft and Indiana Jones oh, and yeah. we're reading Greek mythology and stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, that, that fed my interest over my schooling years. And then I got into university at the University of Pretoria for my undergrad degree. And I took up archaeology as one of my major subjects. And that's when I sort of realized that I'm not going to be doing Greek mythology or um, ancient pyramids in Egypt, I was actually mm -hmm. being introduced into the archaeology of South Africa, which is fascinating mm -hmm. in its own right. Um, and, you know, during that whole undergrad period, I got interested in human bones from archaeological sites. So I wanted to combine artifacts with the humans that made them and left them behind, right? Um, and that's where my adventures into bones really came through. And I somehow landed in the UK for my master's, um, did a whole episode there of my life, which was only about a year and a half uh, that I spent uh, at York University. And then, nice. and then I took another detour when I came back to South Africa after my master's, and I went into underwater archaeology, uh -huh. where I was at the Ezekiel Museums of South Africa in Cape Town. And I could swim at this time. Um, but I didn't know how to scuba dive. And so I was trained as a commercial diver or a scientific diver. Um, so I could dive onto shipwrecks and discover ships and whatever treasures lay under under the waters, right? And uh, yeah, so that was another episode in my crazy journey. And then it progressed to starting my PhD and I went back into um, biological anthropology and try to get onto the forensics track. So I was really interested in forensic archaeology and that's what I wanted to become or specialize in. Um, so I went through the whole PhD uh, route 
And then during my journey, I got sidetracked again, loving all these <laughs> sidetracks. And I got into paleoanthropology. And is it true that your friends call you Bones, like the TV show? Yeah, yeah, they do. They they do call me Bones, um, mostly because, you know, Bones came out when I was in my second year of uni. Um, and I guess that's what also influenced me into going into the whole <laughs> human remains um, in archaeology. And, you know, you try to explain to your friends and family what it is that you do and why you want to look at human remains. And I just had to use Bones as a reference point. And ever since then, when my friends describe what I do to their friends, they're like, oh, yeah, no, she's Bones, you know, from like the TV show. <laughs> and I'm just like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was after you completed your master's here in the UK that you moved to Johannesburg and worked on your PhD. But it was after taking a month off that something happened that changed your life. Yeah, yeah. So, so during my PhD um, at Wits University, I was also a junior lecturer in the archaeology department. And now you can imagine trying to be a student and a teacher at the same time. There's very little, little me time. Um, and mm. so I went through a very hard period in which I was just doing too much and I needed a timeout. Um, so I left my teaching post at WITS, uh, still continued my PhD, but I put it on the back burner for like a month or so just to rest and, you know, pull myself towards myself. Because doing a PhD and, is stressful, my, my friends who've done one have told me. Oh, yeah. It's not it's, just, it's it's not not just writing. <laughs> no, it's not fun. I mean, PhD is not, it's rewarding at the end when you make it to mm. the finish line, but, you know, getting there is really tough. Um, and so I took a month off. And actually, I was planning to take more than a month off, but I only lasted a month. And, you know, most people go on holiday or they spend time with their friends and family. Uh, again, I did that for a month until I got bored because that's how my brain is wired. And um, an ad came out on Facebook that was sent to me by uh, Lindsay Hunter, who was actually one of the original underground nationals. And she was like, hey, um, there's this new ad that's been sent out by Lee Berger. He's looking for a new recruit of underground astronauts. Um, just give it a shot, see what happens. Now, you know, initially I was like, are you crazy? There's no way I could do that. But I had nothing to lose, really. I, I had absolutely nothing to lose. I had all this time, even though I should have been working my PhD, but I was like, nah, let's just do something else for a little bit. And so I responded to the ad. I didn't think I was ever going to make it because I didn't have any caving experience. So one of the things that Ali had put on the ad is that he was looking for young scientists uh, who were engaged in, in archaeology and paleoanthropology, uh, who were athletically fit and not afraid of being in small um, spaces or confined spaces. And having caving experience would be to your advantage. I didn't have any caving experience. Mm. And the only small environments or extreme environment experience I had was from my underwater days. Mm. But you know, I just, I applied. It doesn't hurt to apply. I did. And then I got called in for an interview. And I was like, oh, okay. This is progressing a bit more than I thought it would. And then I got a phone call. It's like, oh, hey, you're part of the team now. Um, please get yourself ready because in a month you'll be going underground. And I was like, ah, okay, now I actually have to do this. I really have to do this now. And, you know, that, that was in 2018. And I've been with the Rising Star team ever since. And it's opened a whole new world for me. It's changed my outlook on fossils because I was never really interested in fossils. Uh, I found them very boring. But with this dynamic group of people, they really came to life for me in a very different way. And for those who don't know, I mean, Lee Berger is a, a very well-respected paleoanthropologist who had already found um, Australopithecus sediba, a new species of, um, of hominid already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was his, his second golden ticket. And he was like, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> Crawling through the Rising Star cave system, that was crazy. To get to the chamber, you have to go through Superman's crawl, which is about 20 centimeters. 
and it's about five meters in length. On your belly, kissing the ground as you go through, inhaling all the dust. And the tiniest point in the shoot is called the pinch point. And it's about 18 centimeters in width. And you have to squeeze yourself. Well, caving and human origins wasn't exactly the direction you'd imagine your life would go. But once working at the Rising Star Cave, also known as the Dinaletti Cave, you were bitten by the so-called hominid bug, and there was no looking back. So what were those initial weeks of caving like for you? Was it easy or a bit of a trial by fire? It was definitely a trial by fire because I was scared. I was mm. really scared. I, like I tried to put on a brave face and to everyone who knows me, they're like, you're the bravest person you've ever met. And I'm just like, nah, dude, I was terrified. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have any caving experience. And there we were in this famous cave. And I knew that there were tight spaces coming ahead. That was my mistake, actually. So when I got news that I was going to be joining the team, I didn't know anything about Rising Star and Hermina Lady. I just knew what was in the news. Um, and now I was watching YouTube videos of watching Steve and Rick and the rest of the crew go into these cave systems. And the spaces are tiny, like absolutely tiny. And I was like, there is no way that my hips and my butt is going to get through there. There is absolutely no way. Um, and, you know, there was this one night I went to my friend's house and we were just having a girls' night, and I told her that, listen, it's a secret, but, you know, I'm doing this thing. And she was like, so mm -hmm. how, what's the smallest space, you know, what's, what's the dimensions? And I'm like, the smallest is a shoot, which is about 15 to 20 centimeters um, in width that I have to fit through. And we looked at her bed, and, you know, the measurements from her bed to the floor were about um, 18 centimeters. And she was like, okay, let's see if you can get under the bed. And there I was. I I went in and my butt got stuck. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be me in the cave. I'm, I'm going to get stuck. <laughs> um, but fortunately, I didn't. Wow. I mean, I did get stuck sometimes. But, you know, the, the exploration team are just wonderful individuals. And they really do help you get out of tight spaces and keep you calm while they're trying to help you. So, um <sighs> I, I was just put at ease as soon as I got um, acquainted with the cave after a couple of days of going in there. Well, this channel has explored the world of the Rising Star Cave before, as seen on my interviews with Matthew Berger and Jeremy De Silva. Now, for those who don't know about this remarkable site, can you tell us about the Rising Star Cave and also about the species of hominid that was found there? Um, so the Rising Star Cave System is one of many caves in the cradle of humankind in South Africa. Um, this is the largest concentration of um, hominid-bearing fossil sites that we have for the southern hemisphere of the world, I could say. And Rising Star was one of them. And what makes Rising Star very unique is that uh, within its chambers, are we found, um, I say we, the previous expedition members found at least 15,000, approximately 15,000 um, individual bones that represent 15 individuals of one hominid species in one chamber. Uh, this was an incredible find. It's never been, something like this has never been discovered before. Um, and you know, that that is pretty rare, incredible, and it does pose some very interesting um, questions that can come from it, right? Um, and, you know, if I could talk about the journey to the dinner lady chamber. So you have rising stars, the cave system, and there are two main chambers, dinner lady and the city. And it took us about 20 to 30 minutes to get to these chambers, crawling through all these tight spaces. And you think that these um, chambers are very far away from the mouth of the cave and really deep into the cave but they're about maybe 20 meters away. So if it takes us 30 minutes to get there and it's only 20 meters, you must know that mm. the journey to get there is incredibly hard, but also very rewarding when you dig up all those fossils.
Kinilwe, why do you think that these hominids did what they did, dragging presumably dead bodies of other Naledi through this winding, pitch-black passageway to their final resting place deep underground? What is the general consensus as to their motivation? And also, what is your personal take on it? So one of the um, questions or hypotheses that were thrown out there during the initial um, expedition was that these hominins were dragging their dead into these chambers and um, leaving the bodies there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there was a, a lot of hoo-ha about this in, in uh, the archaeology and paleo circles. Um, but you know, that's, that's science. You, you throw something out there and you try to see if it's true or false, you know? We're not saying it definitely happened, but we're not saying that it didn't. Um, it's it's very isolated chamber, very difficult to get to. Um, and from being in that space, I can't see any other entrance other than what we came through in the shoot. It's very possible that there are other um, points of entry, but I couldn't see them. Um, so maybe they were, you know, dragging their dead in there for what reason i'll leave that up to you to decide um and i think i think we should just be patient and wait for the next cycle of research that's going to come out it might answer this might not or it might lead us to ask more questions because um all the bones that were found in, the, in as i say the final resting place they were the same species weren't they yes yes they were all Hermina lady, there was no mixing, there was no um, signs of um, animals having carried them into that space because there's no taphonomy um, on the bones, like no claw marks or teeth marks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting assemblage of just one species, which, like I said, does not happen in the record at all. And also, uh, they didn't have any light. I mean, you had light, you know, how did they do it? <laughs> they, they must have had super eyes or the sense of touch, you know. Um, again, it, it requires more research, looking into animal behavior and how they navigate themselves um, in the dark. We know that us humans don't do it very well, but this doesn't mean that our hominin um, ancestors didn't have their skills with them. Well, that's right. And uh, I suppose that this could have been going on for, I don't know, decades or longer. You know, with, it could have been a tradition. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, it doesn't look like it happened all in one event, like a catastrophic event. Um, it does seem like there are layers and layers or episodes of this happening. Um, so it could have been a long-term event that happened. Oh, it's so fascinating. <laughs> and they're still finding stuff, aren't they? I mean, they're still going, you're still going down there, still finding things in not only that chamber, but other chambers. Yeah. So in the past year, I think it's been, uh, we sort of stopped working at, at Rising Star in the Dinner Lady and the City chambers. We just put a pause on that for a while and we focus our attention on the new fossil site that I'm working at, which is um, UW105. So that has been our main focus. Although I have been hearing the grapevine that we might be going back into Rising Star, might not. We'll see how things go. There haven't really been a lot of people of color in the world of paleoanthropology or archaeology. But with your becoming a National Geographic explorer, you're now seen as the face of a changing world. So uh, what has this journey been like for you? Yeah, um, all of a sudden I've become the poster girl for people in color in archaeology and paleoanthropology. Not something that I set out to do. Um, I just, I mean, I, I got into the field of archaeology because of my fascination for the past. And it was a life's passion for me, so I, I never gave up on it. Um, and I guess you know, I, I never really had any role models that looked like me in the field that I could aspire to be. Mm -hmm. I just, I sort of, went, I marched to the beat of my own drum. And, you know, I just, I've just been going and going and going and going. Um, and when I was teaching, um, 
at the archaeology department at Wits, you know, one of the students said that, you know, you, you really inspire me. Uh, it's good to know that there are people like you that represent people like me. And I was just like, oh, okay, this, this is actually a big thing. I, hmm. okay, um, maybe I should just continue on. You know, not that I had any thoughts of giving up, but, you know, sometimes you want to step away from the limelight, be in the shadows and do your thing. When um, people like that, when they come to you and they say that you inspire them, it really motivates you to get out there again yeah. um, and to really put your best foot forward and to have everybody see you and be very loud about it, right? And, you know, you're very right that there are very few people of color in the paleo sciences. And, you know, there could be numerous um, reasons for this. Uh, archaeology is not a lucrative um, industry to be in. You're not going to get rich doing it. It's all about the passion. And if we're very honest, in South Africa, there are um, disadvantaged groups. And hmm. we have, and some of us have to support families. So we do need jobs, and there are very few jobs in paleo sciences. So that could be one of the reasons why there are not that many um, people of color in the industry is because, mm. you know, there are realities. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to have a roof over your head. And so you need a job or you need to follow a course that is going to secure a job for you at the end of the day. Um, that's one of the reasons I can think of off the top of my head. The discovery of UW105 was made public in late 2020 and was one of a large network of underground caves in the cradle of humankind, a world heritage site under an hour's drive east of Johannesburg. So we are in the block chamber uh, and in the block chamber we have the fossil wall and with this fossil wall, um, so every white speck that you see on the, on the wall are actually fossils that have been trapped in the breccia, waiting to be excavated. But is there anything cool that you're working on right now that perhaps uh, you can uh, tell us about? Now as a postdoc researcher, I'm exclusively with the center of um, the exploration of deep human journey adverts. And so my focus is on research and exploration of the cradle of humankind. And uh, so I've been involved in UW105 since last year, 2020, and we're still going strong. So I'm going to continue working at UW105. And also I'm planning to go into Gladysville Cave, which is another famous fossil site in the cradle, uh, and looking for more hominins and other fossil remains um, that Lee Berger didn't find <laughs> when he was working there. Uh, so those are the, the two projects that I have um, rolling at the moment. There are, of course, other um, projects coming up. Uh, can't share too much about them now simply because I'm still wrapping my heads around them. Um, but they seem to be very exciting and they will keep me busy for a very long time. And of course, Gladys Vale is uh, associated with Lee Berger, of course. But before that, uh, was it Robert Broom? Yes. So before Lee Berger, um, we had Robert Broom and Philip Tobias also visiting Gladys Vale Cave and doing some research there, um, as well as the Peabody um, camp from University of Berkeley, I think it was. I think they also did some work in that area. Um, so yeah, it's... It's an incredible legacy, well, not, I won't say legacy, but an incredible incredible repertoire that um, I'll be following off from. I don't think Robert Broom found anything that he published on, like it was very popular um, from Gladysville. Uh, we do know from Gladysville it has a huge faunal assemblage. So there's lots of animal fossil remains. Um, the, there's a giant tahina. I think is from Glasgow and a, a wild dog as well. So there's a, a huge um, faunal assemblage. You have horses and antelope at Glasgow. So they give us a nice representation of what the environment, the cradle might have looked like. Um, Lee Berger, when he was working there, discovered two hominin teeth. And mm. those were the only hominin remains that were ever found 
at Gladysville. Um, so he wants us to go back in there and be like, let's see if there's anything more because there's also Humnin hair um, that was found at Gladysville. So that's very interesting. Uh, and we'll see if there's anything else to find. A new uh, hominid was found recently, wasn't it? Like the other day it was announced. Uh, I don't know how, how they pronounce it, Longi or Longi, um, the closest um, to our own lineage, to, to Homo sapiens found in China. It's been around for a while, but they've only just sort of dusted it off properly. What did you think of that? Yeah, so was it Saturday or Sunday morning? I just woke up and my Twitter was on blast. Uh, everyone's talking <laughs> about Dragon Man, uh, the That's new a, yeah. um, fossil that was found in, in Asia, I think it was. Hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's fascinating. I still have to to catch up on the reading um, of it, but you know that's that's the magic of paleoanthropology and open access science, right? It's open to everyone. Everyone can make a comment. Everyone has access to reading about it and to learning even more. And that's fantastic. That you know this whole open access thing hasn't been around for a very long time, and the fact that it's happening during my time, I think is amazing. Absolutely. Well, it's such an amazing journey that you've taken to get where you are now. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show and tell us about your work. Now, if there are young people watching this, perhaps people of color who need a bit of encouragement to follow their dreams into the sciences, what would you say to them right now? Oh, wow. Uh, listen, <laughs> I'm going to be super, super honest. Um, you know, like I said before, just march to the beat of your own drum. You know what it is that you want. So you have to just stay true to your own path, you know? Um, and I think one of the things that was a success for me is that along my journey, I found my tribe members that were for me, people that supported me. And that is what you should look out for, people who will support you and nurture you. And that's one of the key ways in which you'll make it towards the finish line. I will leave links to your work and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Kinelwe, and hopefully we can have you back on the show one day in the very near future. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Um, and please invite me again. Um, maybe I'll have some more updates for you on what. Cannot wait. <laughs>